Okay, so there are many systems of modal logics, but they're all essentially built on a basic system called K. Uh, the system K uh, takes its name from this guy, Saul Kripke, uh, and we'll definitely be encountering him a bit in this series. He's one of the most important philosophers uh, and logicians of the past century. Uh, ever since he was just a teenager, he's been making extremely significant contributions to modal logic. Um, yeah, he is definitely an interesting guy. Uh, so, we, uh, we'll we be looking at uh, this system K in quite a bit of detail, but first we need to um, run through the sort of basic structure and semantics, and uh, first of all are the formation rules. The formation rules for system K. It's pretty simple, uh, you just take the um, standard formation rules for propositional logic, so any loan propositional variable is a well-formed formula, if A is a well-formed formula, not A is a well-formed formula, uh, let X be any binary operator, and or, if then, or uh, if, if and only if, then if A and B are well-formed formulas, A, X, B is a well-formed formula, that's all, that's all completely standard stuff. Uh, now in modal logics, uh, we add if A is a well-formed formula, necessarily A and possibly A are well-formed formulas. So those are the formation rules for modal, our basic modal propositional logic. Um, but uh, how how does this how does this work? What about how do we sort of assign uh, truth values and such to uh, these these operators? How, what are the truth conditions? Well. Let's recall how we apply truth values under normal circumstances. We, uh, we use an interpretation of the language, and an interpretation is simply a function, which I will, I will call A, um, that assigns a truth value to each propositional variable. So we have the function A that assigns a truth value to each propositional variable. So let's say we let the propositional variable P stand for pigs can fly, and we let uh, the variable Q stand for the sky is blue. Well then, obviously P is false, so we, we can uh, assign it zero. And um, here A stands for the assignment function, uh, and you, you can read this statement as being the value, the value of P is zero, or just P is false, right? Q, of course, is uh, is true, so the value of Q is 1. Q is true. So uh, right here, we have uh, we have an interpretation, right? This is, this is an interpretation, uh, and we can use this interpretation to figure out the truth values of more complex formulas. So, you know, I mean, we can say that uh, the value of uh, P and Q is false, because, of course, one of the conjuncts is false. Obviously, the value of the disjunction is, is true. Um, this is all completely standard stuff, nothing unusual there. But what about in modal logic? How, how uh, do we introduce the uh, notions of possibility and necessity into uh, an interpretation? Um, well, we use something called possible worlds semantics. Um, and the, the basic form of possible world semantics was proposed by Saul Kripke, um, although it, it, what he suggested wasn't quite the same thing. Um, but possible world semantics uses the notion of possible worlds, and uh, if you have no idea what possible worlds are, I suggest you check out my basic introduction video that I put up. Right, the way we use possible worlds is this. So first of all we have what's called a model, and, a, and our model consists of three elements, W, R, and A. Now in modal logic we think of W, when we're using possible world semantics, we think of W as the set of possible worlds, uh, and each individual world can be labelled W0, W1, W2, W3, and so on. Sometimes you see them labelled W, V, U, X, etc., um, you can label them what you want, really. Uh, but W is the set of possible worlds. And A here, A, 
that's just the assignment function, right? Now, before uh, it, when we it, you know looked in the last slide, the assignment function simply uh, assign truth values to propositional variables. That's how it works in um, the sort of standard propositional logic is we use the assignment function to assign truth values to propositional variables. Now in modal logic the assignment function assigns truth values to propositional variables within each individual world. Okay so Let's say, for example, that WO is the actual world. WO represents the actual world. And let's say that um, P stands for pigs can fly. Okay? So we, uh, we have this, right? And the, the, uh, the way to read this is simply the value of P at world W0 is zero. Okay? The value of P at world W zero is zero. Or just P is false at world zero. P is false at W zero. Right? Okay, so then we can pick out some possible world where pigs can fly. Let's say W one is a world where pigs can fly. Well then the value of P at W one is one. P is true at W one. Right, so that I hope is uh, fairly simple. What about this one here, R? Now R is a binary relation on the worlds in W and we call it uh, the accessibility relation and, it, and it's essentially a relation between possible worlds, a binary relation between possible worlds uh, and it's written W O R W 1 and that statement there, that W O R W 1, that's red. W 1 is accessible from W 0. That's how we read that statement there. Now this is a very important concept, um, but what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean to say that one world is accessible from another? Uh, I want to give you um, a sort of intuitive sense of what's going on here, because this is a very important part of this. Um, so Let's uh, take a look at this diagram. Okay, so here we have our uh, our world W0. Um, W0, we'll say, represents the actual world, and W1, this is our other world, this represents some other possible world. Now this arrow here represents the accessibility relation. So we have W0, R, W1, which means that W1 is accessible from W0. Okay? Now, let's say that P stands for pigs can fly. Okay? Now then the value of P at well at W0 is 0 because of course uh you know pigs can't fly. Pigs can't fly in the actual world, so the value of P at W0 is 0. Now let's say that W1 is some world with completely different laws of nature and one of the uh, many strange things within it is flying pigs. Well then the value of P at W1 is 1. Okay, um, That's what we covered in the last slide. So then we have this, the accessibility relation. And what this means is that because world W0 accesses W1, and because P is true at W1, then possibly P is true at W0. So the idea is that if some proposition P is true at any world that W0 accesses, then possibly P is true at W0. Right? Okay, I hope that that's made it a bit clearer. Uh, now, if we say it's possible for pigs to fly, then we we're, we we might be talking about uh, logical possibility. Um, pigs flying doesn't contravene any laws of logic. But what if we we want to uh, talk about what's possible relative to the actual laws of nature? Obviously, um, you know, if we talk about what's possible relative to the actual laws of nature, then pigs can't fly. Now. 
we can we can restrict the class of possible worlds that we're talking about by by changing the way the accessibility relation works. And if we want to talk about what's possible relative to the actual laws of nature, then W0 will no longer access those worlds which have different laws of nature. Okay? So the accessibility relation will no longer hold between W0 and W1 because W1 has different laws of nature. And because W0 no longer accesses W1, well then possibly P is no longer true at W0 because W0 doesn't access any worlds at which P is true. So um, that sort of that's totally intuitive. Uh, I hope that that gives you a, a sort of sense of what's going on here. Um, in order for possible, in order if we say it's possible for pigs to fly, then we must be, um, you know, we must be quantifying over those those possible worlds which have different laws of physics. And when we say it's impossible for pigs to fly, we must be restricting uh, our our range to just those possible worlds which have um, the same laws of physics as ours. So when we say it's impossible, if we want to talk about what's possible relative to the actual laws of physics, then this accessibility relation no longer holds between W0 and all other worlds. There are some worlds that it no longer accesses. So I hope that's giving you a sort of in intuitive sense of what's going on with the accessibility relation. Okay, so the, th this accessibility relation uh, allows us to define more formally the truth conditions for necessity and possibility. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so this is necessity here, and what this says is simply that um, the value of necessarily p at world 1 equals 1 if and only if for every w1 such that w1 is accessible from w0 the value of p at w1 equals 1. Uh, so, in other words, p uh, is ne ne so necessarily p is true at w0 if and only if p is true at every world that is accessible from w0. Uh, so let's uh, just take some, some diagrams to make sure that you got it. Right, so uh, here are three worlds. We will label this world 0, world 1 and world Two. Um, world 0 accesses world 1 and world 2 um, and we'll say that P is true in both world 1 and world 2. Okay, So since P is true in every world that 0 accesses, necessarily P is true in 0. Pretty simple stuff. Um, another diagram. Uh, so here we've got another three worlds. 0, 1, and 2. Uh, 0 accesses 1, and 1 accesses 2. And let's say that P is true at 1, but not true at 2. So is necessarily P true at world 0? Well, yes it is. Uh, because look, z 0 only accesses one world. Um, and in the world that 0 accesses, P is true. Now, if we were to put an arrow from 0 to 2, then necessarily P would be false at 0, because uh, not P is the case at 2. But we don't have that arrow. We, uh, we, we have an arrow from 0 to 1, and uh, that's, that's all. That's the only world 0 accesses where P is true. Now, of course, at world 1, well, world 1 accesses world 2, where not P is true. So necessarily P is false at world 1. That's, uh, I think, uh, quite simple. Hopefully you get the idea there. Uh, so let's have a look at possibility. Well, possibly P. Um, OK, so the value of possibly P at world 0 equals 1 if and only if there is some world W1 such that W1 is accessible from W0 and the value of P at world W1 equals 0. Um, equals 1, sorry, the value of P at world W1 equals 1. So in other words, possibly P is true at W0 just as long as there is one world accessible from W0 at which P is true. It might be false in all other worlds. As long as there is one world accessible from W0 at which P is true, then possibly P is true 
at W0. So I'm sure you can figure out this diagram. We've got 0, axis is 1, axis is 2 again, and you've got P is true at 1, not P is true in 2, obviously because P is true in one of the world's zero accesses, possibly P is true at zero. Um, so if you take this diagram again, let's say you have uh, not P in one and P in two, uh, well in this one, possibly P is false at world zero because it only accesses one world, zero accesses one, and that's the only world zero accesses, and not P and P is false at the world zero accesses, so possibly P is false at zero. Of course, one accesses world two, and P is true at world two, so possibly P is true at world one. Even though world one has uh, not P in it, the point is that it accesses a world at which P is true. So you can have both not P and possibly P. Um, that's not a contradiction or anything. Okay, so that's... Um, that's pretty much it then for, uh, for this uh, video. Um, I hope that was helpful and uh, we'll have a look at some other things um, and we'll have a go at some problems and stuff. But uh, I think that's enough for now. Okay, thanks for watching.